Welcome to the Win Make Give Podcast. Chad Himes here. Bob Stewart over there. Bob, how you doing today? I'm I'm over here. I am over here. That's good to know. Bob, you're wearing a hat. You almost always wear a hat. Uh, our audience doesn't get to see. So I do you have know. hair though, Chad. Some people think I don't have hair, but I do. Some people think that's why you wear the hat to cover up the fact that you don't have hair. No, I proudly don't wear a hat, don't have hair. Yet I almost wore a hat today. And it was a hat you gave me, and you'll know exactly which hat it would have been when we get to something in the conversation today. Uh, oh, is there? A, is, is this part of the conversation? It is. That hat, if I were to be wearing it indoors, and it's bad enough to wear a hat in Florida sometimes, it just makes you sweat wearing one. I'm definitely not going to wear one indoors. But one of the things on our list for today's conversation, Bob, when we dive into it, it, it is going to fit with the hats. <laughs> How many hats do you think you're at, Bob? Well, I did, you know, I, I stopped, right? Like, I like know. Not, not this year. This year has been controlling my shoe addiction. Last year was controlling my hat addiction, which, by the way, I um, – People 200. still sent you hats. You just didn't buy hats. Yeah, correct. I did buy – I made one hat order. It was for a bunch of place hats because I had to replace my work hat or whatever. But I probably have 200, 200 in the house and another 200 in a couple boxes out in the garage. Folks, I want to know. Join us in our Facebook group, facebook.com slash winmakegift. What is that collection that you have just too many of? <laughs> right? if you're, like, if don't you're tell me I collect money because you don't have too much money. Uh, but what's that collection that you have? They, when we moved, Bob, uh, Nita made me get rid of, donate, bring to the library, bring to schools, give to people. Books, because I have so many books. And it's not often I go back and reread too many books. And she said, look. I love that you love books. I love, you have too many books though. Pick the ones you want to reference, pick the ones you always want to be able to go back to, but it's time to donate off some of those other ones. Uh, I want to know audience, your excessive collection item. What is it that you have hiding in the drawers, boxes, somewhere in your house? I'm, mine's changing. It's based, mine's quickly becoming baseball. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you, you wore hats. You broke that habit. You're breaking the shoe habit. Yet, Bob, you're probably spending just as much money buying baseball cards. You're just confusing the way to where it's going. My boys are at the age where they're starting to like sports too. So now I'm using them as an excuse to buy shit that I could never could have as a kid, right? I'm like, ooh, look at this jersey. I should buy this signed jersey and then hang it on my son's wall. And uh, my wife is like, you need to stop all of this madness. But anyway. Bob, here's a tip. On the back of the framed jersey you got hanging on the wall, make sure you put property of dad. No, you can't take your <laughs> college with you. Uh, Otherwise, that kid's going. No, that's my Michael Jordan jersey. Well, on one, of the, one of the jerseys is is has Stewart as the last name, and then the other one has Carter because his name's Carter Stewart. So I've yeah, got I two jerseys. Um, he he get he can keep the Carter one. I'll probably keep the Stewart one. Right? Like, <laughs> okay. So Bob, I'm going to put you on the spot. This has nothing to do with anything, folks. You know that we usually babble for a while. Uh, if you could have one signed, authentic jersey, any of the sports. Who's the athlete that goes on the wall that you want a signed, authentic jersey from? Oh, man, that's a really, really hard question. Um, I'll let you pick one from each sport if you can't do it. Okay, so yeah. I, I, one from each sport. I mean, my favorite player, I would go right to my childhood. Uh, it's, it's George Brett was my favorite baseball player, Chad. I would hang a George Brett jersey. Uh, my favorite football player was Marcus Allen. I would hang a Marcus Allen jersey. And my favorite right. baseball player, I'm sorry, my favorite basketball player was Magic Johnson. Like, and I would hang those simply because it connects me to that, like the roots of my obsession with sports, which I think served me well in my life. You know, my, the lessons I learned growing up as a kid and playing team sports, yeah. were lessons I took into my, my work career and, you know, the, this hard work and persistence and how to deal with losing and all these things. Um, so that's why I would probably go back to there. I, I, I catch me on a different day and I might say Ken Griffey Jr. And, um, and you know, Sean Kemp, because those were kind of the ones that ignited my passion for sports later in life and stuff. But yeah, the, were you? Well, if I had to pick one of you, a Jackie Robinson jersey, yeah. right? If I had an authentic anything, it would be Jackie. Um, that would be my baseball one if I, if I were to break it down. Football would be Lawrence Taylor. I, okay. He changed the game, and I, I was at that age of watching him change the game of football. Uh, basketball, 
I'm not a basketball fan. That's that's my least favorite. I loved Magic Johnson, though, when I did. So Magic or Michael, just to be, you know, cliche in that area. And then it would probably be Wayne Gretzky, uh, you know, maybe one of the oh. Maple Leafs when I was younger, like, uh, you know, I've got a, or something like that. I got a third year Gretzky card around here that I got my hands on recently. I, I, I'm aggressively after a Jackie Robinson right now. Like one of these weeks, we're going to show up here and I'm going to have the, the graded Jackie Robinson card to show you here either at 1956 or 57. Both of those are really cool pictures of him. But anyway, all right, what are we talking about today? Well, when I that happens, just put that in the will for me. All right. That all one right. comes to me if something happens. Yeah, all right. So let's get off of all that, Bob. Uh, bringing back our childhood, that's something that really wait, 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 wait. Before we get off of that, I went because we're, there were mutual friends with him. Apparently, like 12 years ago, I told Kevin Kaufman I'd give him the – Billy Ripken F face card. Do you know about this baseball card, Chad? Of course I do. Absolutely. Yeah. So do I've got do? it. I've got four of them. Um, and I've, apparently in the rain camp in Dallas, Texas, uh, from stage, I said to Kevin, he could have one of my Billy Ripken F face cards. Now, I don't know why the hell I would have done this. He can't seem to remember why. Apparently it was just out of the goodness of my heart. But he started harassing me last week about it. So Kevin, stupid. your stupid card is in the mail. I, I threw a gift in there for you or whatever, but anyway. Awesome. Does, yes, I wonder if the I, audience, I, does our audience know that in 1989, a baseball player wrote the real F word, F face, on the bottom of his baseball bat, and the cards got published. Hundreds of thousands of that card went out with F face on the bottom of Billy Ripken's bat. That's some, yes, one before of the they found it, edited it out in the picture, yeah. and then reprinted the card uh, in the more mass quantity. That's why it's actually an error card, and it's a limited edition error card. And I'll bet about 10% of our audience probably knew that, Bob. Um, okay. So we're talking about some life hacks, and, and I think that we almost addressed one right there, which is go back to your childhood every now and then, right? Mm. Uh, for some of us, that's farther back than others, yet going back to your childhood is going to be one of those great ways, Bob, that gives you an unfair advantage in life because we had a, an unbridled passion, an unbridled energy at that point in our lives when we were kind of getting ready to really start life. I don't mean childhood like five, six years old. But I'm talking back that the college grad years when we were about to hit the world uh, and so many of us, me specifically, hit the world and then went flop, right? Uh, and then had to pick ourselves up. What we're going to talk about today, Bob, is if we went back in time and heck, even if we don't go back in time, where we are today, we wanted to share life hacks that are going to give you an unfair advantage moving forward. And Bob, I love it because I challenged you to do the homework for today's episode and you did not give me a list of 10 life hacks. You gave me 11, Bob Stewart, <laughs> and I love you for it. So let's dive into it, Bob. I, the I first you. hack on the life hack list that you sent over is what? Uh, th this is like, th Chad, I'm 47 years old. Okay. Yep. Um, you're, you're, you've, you've crossed the next threshold, I think. I'm coming to 53. And By the time this drops, I'll be real close. Maybe you maybe you felt like this at some point. Maybe you feel like it right now. I don't know. Um, I, I'm in this this place where keeping up with relationships outside of my nuclear core family, my wife and my kids, yeah. is getting more and more challenging. Yes. Um, but I think that doing it and making the time for it is really, really important. Um, so keeping up with relationships beyond your spouse and your kids or that kind of core nuclear family that you see like every day, day in and day out. Now, they're easily the most important people in my life. It's why I choose to spend most of that time with them. But what I find, Chad, is it's really easy to get into the routines with your family and you, you start to lose those connections with the, your friends that, you know, and you, you always you get together with them and you're like, oh, we should do this more often. And, but if you don't purposely set out to do it, um, it's not going to happen. I, I love Jesse Itzler. You know, he, he's got like some of the stuff he does where once a quarter he does something that like him and his boys have yeah. never done. A lot of times he's doing that with a friend or something. Um, I, I think these are things that we, we have to, we have to prioritize them or those relationships and those bonds that you built all through your teens and your twenties and your thirties, as you start to get later in life, they start to fall apart. Yeah. I think you, that's, you, a, does, this, does this resonate with you at all? A hundred percent. I think it's such a great point, Bob. And, and the thing I'm seeing in people is when you start to lose those relationships 
because of your your nuclear family, right? That you you said you, you you know you got your your partner, maybe your kids, maybe mom and dad that are kind of depending on what your family looks like. Uh, you get to a point where the kids get to a certain age, they go have their own lives, and then what happens if something happens to your partner? Now all of a sudden, you find yourself alone, isolated, yeah. Because you haven't created other relationships, your kids went on to have their own lives doesn't mean they don't want you around, but you're not around the same way. And you find yourself all alone in life. And I think if we knew that, then we would keep up a lot of our relationships that they're always with us. Now, I'm blessed. I had a group of guys who became my friends in high school. That's really when we all met or I met into them. Some of them knew each other even earlier than that. And it doesn't matter. We still we have a chat that's going all the time, jokes about anything, whatever is going on at the moment, sharing moments when something hard is happening. We just had something happen in our world and they were all there without a hesitation. I just got to see one of them in person for the first time in uh, 15 plus years we figured it out and we picked up just like it was yesterday. And it's keeping up those relationships, Bob. Because so many of our relationships, I'm sorry to say it, and I'm sorry to anybody that I am, that I put in this position, so many of our relationships are relationships of convenience, Ooh. right? I mean, you, you and I got to spend time together. Dave uh, and I got to spend a lot of time together. Ben and I, and all, we got to spend a lot of time together, especially during COVID, right? Because we would get together, we would record, we would do all that stuff. I moved away. I, I don't, I, ne, once every three months, Dave and I find time to make a phone call or something. Uh, you know, Ben and I will text back and forth now and then when there's something really worthy of texting about. Otherwise, a lot of these relationships, Bob, they become relationships of convenience. And when you move or they move, all of a sudden you look up and we didn't keep those going. We find ourselves isolated at some point in our life because we've either aged up right? Or we've lost somebody along the way who was one of the very few. So keep those relationships going, keep growing them, keep developing them, keep creating new ones. That is absolutely going to give you an unfair advantage in life because we were not meant to be alone. Love All it. right. Love it. Life hack um, number two. Number two, it's the hat, right? It's, hat. it's the hat that I would be wearing if I were wearing a hat right now. You gave me this hat. You came into the podcast studio one day you had bought hats for all of us and you said this one is clearly for you chad and put it on my desk and it says nobody cares work harder so <laughs> this this is life hack number two and part of me is tempted to tattoo this like on my back or something so if i'm working out and people are running behind me that right nobody cares just work harder um Bob, that's the thing. I mean, and that isn't, sadly, it's an unfair advantage. Everybody wants someone to care. Everybody wants somebody to, to listen to them, to pity them, to, oh, I'm not good enough. Oh, I'm not tall enough. Oh, I'm not fast enough. Whatever. It is. Nobody cares. Everybody really cares about themselves. I'm sorry to say it. When it really comes down to it, people are like, I don't care. Work harder. I, right? what, you know what, what, you rings, take what, what rings in my head on this is like, it's a very similar statement, essentially, from David Goggins, which is nobody's coming to save you. Yes. Same, same, right? Like, nobody's coming to save you. Nobody cares about the problems that you got going on. Work harder. I, for me, with watching my, you know, I have a six-year-old right now. He's got dreams of going to the NBA. Now, I, I'm not going to tell him, hey, he's likely to probably max out at six foot two, and he's, he's you know, half me, so he can't jump that high. Well, I, hey, I Spud Webb could high. dunk. I was gonna say I could actually jump pretty high, Chad, but but you know, like he, physically, he's not gonna have, he's not gonna be somebody that people look at and go, "Oh, this kid." So he's gonna have to work his ass off. And right now, he's working hard, but he's so much better than the other kids that he plays with. He hasn't hit that adversity yet, and I'm actually looking forward to him running into that adversity and getting his ass kicked out on the basketball court by some other kid that's been working harder than him. So when he comes back and he's sad. You know, and this is a little bit twisted, maybe, but I don't care. I'll give you some insight into my psychology. Like, and I want to be able to say to him, look, it doesn't matter. Work harder. If we want to be better than that kid, we're going to have to work harder than him. Guess what? We put up a half hour's worth of shots yesterday. He put up 45 minutes. We did a half hour's worth of dribbling yesterday. He put in an hour. That's why he did what he did to you, right? He was working harder. So I don't know. This one to me is. It sounds weird to call this a life hack. 
right? And yet it's as soon Once as you, you take get that it, mindset. Yeah. There you go. As soon as you get it, you'll understand how this is a life hack to you. We're not saying we don't care about you, right? We we do care about you. I, I care about lots of people. I get the pleasure of working with lots of people. I, I care about a lot of people. Yet when it comes down to it, nobody really cares. You have to do the work because nobody's going to sit around and, and fix it for you. No one's coming to save you. Great, great hack you had on this this list, Bob. What did you put as the next one on this hack? Man, this one to me, when I came This one confused it, me. When you sent this list over and this one was on it, I was like, huh? Until I, I kind of dove into it a little bit more. There's a book called The Untethered Soul, that, and Ben had us read it. Have you ever read The Untethered Soul, Chad? Uh, yes, of course. It's this idea of like, we are, like, every thought we have is like based on some past programming that's been put in our head. Right. Right. And a lot of us, you know, when you're in an argument with somebody, like you say things, your brain thinks a certain thing and you react or say the thing that, that comes into your brain, but you don't give any thought to the programming that made that thought come in. Yes. Right. So think before you think me, like, it's not necessarily like, you know, it's like, I, I think something that I got to like, once it's in my head, I have two choices from there. I can put it out of my mouth or I can try to figure out where did that even come from? And that idea of trying to figure out like, where did that come from? Like, I'll give you an example. I, you know, I, I, we talk about, I see a therapist and I, I've got a little, have some anger challenges, especially with my kids. Right. And this is, I'm, I'm like, I have anxiety. And I, I used to get really upset with them when they would like not do what I said, right? And so I'd say something to them and I'd be like, oh, I didn't do it. And I'd be like, oh, you're going to do it, right? Now, when I say something and they don't do it and that, that you know, that anger, I'm like, oh, they're going to do it. I got to get upstream and figure out like, where does that come from, right? right? And I'm never going to change that behavior unless I think about where my thoughts are coming from. So the, the think before you think is what was on the, I would actually say like, Think about where your thoughts are coming from. And that's the whole concept of that book, The Untethered Soul. It's to kind of get above yourself. Like when you're mad, get outside. Like why? Do, do we ever think about these things? And I think like, look, you're, you're, a lot of us have behaviors we'd love to, to modify and adapt. And we know they're not serving us very well. You're never going to get out of those behaviors unless you can kind of identify why you have the thoughts you have in those scenarios. Yeah, that, that's a great point. When we have discussions around the house that are financial, Nita usually has to start the conversation with, are you in a good frame of mind because of past thoughts? And until I got to a point where I was like, well, why do I always get defensive when we have this conversation? Why do I react in a way that is, why are you questioning me, right? And why does it matter? And when I started to think about where all that stuff came from now, it's not the blurting out of my mouth response. It's not the attack that I have to then say, sorry, I didn't mean that, or I didn't intend to hurt you or something later and make up for it. Now I've been able to adjust thoughts in my head or at least find where that thought started so I could kind of change the roadmap in my head so that I didn't get back to that each and every time. I think that's a great little hack, Bob. Uh, too many of us never take time to think about where our thoughts come from. We just react to the thoughts that come to our head. And sadly, a lot of times our programming brings negative things out of our mouth, like you yelling at the kids or something in that. All right. I love this next one, Bob. Uh, here's a life hack for you folks. And I, I guess you're figuring this out. These aren't like, hey, you can tie your shoe faster this way type of life hack, or this isn't a create a <laughs> shortcut on your phone life hack. This is for your brain life hack, right? And as you get these things, uh, you're going to have a better life. You're going to have that unfair advantage. And Bob, this is one that took me a long time to get. Uh, and that's competition is for losers, mm. right? Competition is for losers. Uh, because here's the thing, this, this is in, in all of our life. When we are pushing ourselves to be the best at what we can be, right? We will succeed. When we push ourselves and know the motivation behind while we push ourselves, we will be the best we can be. As soon as we start to compete with others, we always compare ourselves to others because there is always someone better than us. Always. There's a very rare time that, you know, you get 
you know, Usain Bolt that nobody's faster than him. Okay. But here's the thing. Even when you get to that, even, like, let's say you're Michael Phelps. So you get to the point where you, you won all the Olympic medals. You got all the world records. Just wait 10 years and somebody else, can, they're all gone. He doesn't have right. one world record left anymore, right? So, like, had he been defining himself and, and everything was built around this idea of, like, man, I'm the world record holder, like, he's a loser now. And, and right. he's not. Obviously, he knows that he maximized everything that he did, every stroke that he took, every practice that he had, right? He was at the top of his game. But the top of his he, – he was the best he could have ever been. Yes, he I mean – have to compare it, himself. Think about the argument, right? We, was Babe Ruth the greatest baseball player? What about Willie Mays? And we're talking different generations, and then you get to who's today. Uh, Nita and I love watching cycle racing, and Eddie Merck is considered the greatest you know, road race cyclist of all time, yet he couldn't hold a candle to the guys today. Why? Because technology is advanced, training is advanced, nutrition is advanced. We've learned all these things that if you're competing with people, whether it's for ever – like Michael Phelps would have or something or a greatest of all time, or whether you're just competing with someone because I'm going to sell more widgets than them, or I'm going to run faster than them. It's never going to be good enough because there'll always be that next person to compare yourself to. It's that gap and the gain conversation, right? When we're competing with ourselves, when I'm looking to go run the fastest I can run, I can train and push myself to that level yet. I'll never catch up to, those marathon, right? The guys who are winning, I'm never going to, and I'll always see that gap that's going to be there in that situation. Folks don't say, Chad, never say never. No, never. I will never be a five minute miler for 26 miles. Um, all we can do is compete with ourselves. Competition is for losers. It's just push yourself to the next level. Bob, take us to the next one. Um, creating obstacles for yourself is the way. Chad, okay. creating obstacles. Um, this this is a concept that I don't know if you, you know who Ryan Holiday is. Yes, in his his book. Um, the some of his books made my some of his books made my list. We actually did a Stoic episode based on uh, one of Ryan's books. But th- this is the idea that like problems, challenges, obstacles are are opportunities to grow and learn. And there's th- we all get them. We all, we all suffer them, some of us more frequently than others. But given, Chad, that we all experience them, then the hack is how do you deal with it? Like how do you, how do you frame it? What do you do with that obstacle? Do you trip over it, get up, pout, go home, not try again, right? Do you, or do you go, oh, whew, I'm not tripping over that one next time. Learn something there, right? Like I know on that third turn there's a pretty high obstacle that – like what are you doing? How are you taking the, the challenges and the things that you come across every day, every week, every month, every year in your business and turning those into learning experiences so that you, you, you're you better for it on the other side? Right. Brilliant that we put these obstacles in our way on purpose and then put the right mindset to it when we find an obstacle of how do I conquer? How do I grow? How do I get around over, under, through this obstacle, whatever that is, Bob? Because that is going to be a hack for our life. It is going to get our brain functioning on a different level, which is going to make obstacles not only looked for, then conquered instead of, oh, there's a really big wall. I'm going to just turn around. Yeah, I remember we had a big, a really big deal fall apart early in my career. And I was in my 20s. This is a, you know, a $30 million deal. Like I was going to have more money in my 20s than I'd honestly deserved or was ready to, to handle. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, and, and like, when, like in the moment, it was really hard, really, really hard. And in fact, I probably wallowed for you know, a good week. Right. And then we were like, okay, like what, what can we learn from this? What can we do different? Like it, it led to us having to figure out like a, a viable kind of product out of this company that we had and a, and a viable monetary strategy to, for revenue. Like it just, I think it led to a point where all these years later, we're now in a position with, to, to really have another awesome um, kind of payoff if, if we keep working hard and heading up. But man, I learned a lot from that, Chad. Yeah. <laughs> we learned a bunch of mistakes that we wouldn't do again. We learned ways to like negotiate with people and, and, you know, different, different legal documents we should have had signed all these things. Right. And it could have just been something that, I mean, it could have sent 
kind of sent us into despair and alcoholism and, and like some really bad shit, right? Yes, absolutely. It's a great point, Bob. Folks, obstacles. That's the way. Find them, build them, put them in front of yourself so you can train yourself on how to overcome them as needed. Bob, this next one, I think it's pretty well known. Um, and the next one you have on the list from the research you did is love is spelled T-I-M-E. So T-I-M-E, for those of you who are like, wait, what? He spelled it too quick. I wasn't expecting letters. If you think about it, we know the five love languages. We've talked about them. We've done episodes about them. Uh, it's something I talk about regularly with anybody that I get in a conversation when they're having challenges. Uh, mine are words of affirmation and uh, physical touch. Those are my two love languages. It's not quality time, yet, Bob, love is still spelt T-I-M-E, right? Because just because Nita says something nice to me and, and, and hugs me, kisses me, pats me on the back, touches me, whatever, that's wonderful. But it's always going to be the time that truly yeah. comes. I mean, Chad, if she was doing that, like if you saw her for five minutes a day and she gave you a bunch of kisses and, and compliments and then she was gone the other 23 hours and 55 minutes, you're like, where is she? Eventually you'd yeah. be like, I don't think she likes me very much. Right? <laughs> yes, it, it, right? Time is the thing, folks. And I'm going to also tell you, not only spending the time with the people, but over time, right? We talked about at the beginning, those relationships. Think it's about the, the compounding. The compounding yeah, of time spent and invested. You still have from way back when and how strong those are that, again, you can go years without seeing those people and it's just a chat here. And then you pick it right back up. And that's because you've been compounding that time, as you were saying, Bob. And that's why you look at couples and, you know, that we have a few. Can you make it? Those first years are great. And then can you make it out of those other years? And then it really becomes a the relationship really thrives when you spent that time and you've grown, grown together. Okay. Let's keep flying through the list, Bob. You want, no, you one want can make, no, no, no one can make you feel bad about yourself or inferior without your consent. I really like this one a lot. And look, I'm, I'm raising kids and ki like kids on the playground are some of the most savage individuals that walk the face of the earth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you've got kid. I, I want to ask you this. Is it worse now I or so. was it that bad when we no, were kids I and I just don't remember it? I, here, I think it's worse. It, it gets worse younger because the kids, they can watch the YouTubes and they're getting exposed to things outside of their, their group of peers more easily. And so, you know, the things that maybe we would have heard about from an older brother in fifth grade, these kids are hearing about in second grade, right? So, and it's... So I don't know. I do think, well, you know, I think every generation goes, oh, it's not like it was when we were kids, right? I think but, there's also more, right? There's more diversity in people nowadays. So there's more ways to pick on, bully, you know. And the other thing like is that. you've got the internet. Like it used yeah. to be you left school and that was that. And now some kids, and not my kids because they're young and they're not on the socials. But like, you know, you start to get into like late junior high, high school. Like these kids are now exposed to the to that environment, the good yes. or bad all the time. Right. So but here, here's, I just, I, I firmly believe this and my, uh, I, I have a, I'm going to be careful what I say here. I have a, I have somebody I know okay. that hates to be called dumb. Hates it. Like okay. if you're like, that's dumb, they get like really, really upset. And okay. I, I always thought to myself, I think they think they're dumb. Like, I think this person thinks they're not that smart. And so they get really defensive when somebody calls them dumb. Because when somebody calls me something, I'm not. I'm just like, what? <laughs> I'm, I'm not dumb. <laughs> right? Like, I'm laughing off. When you, when you tell me I'm inferior in some way, if I believe it, I might be upset. Yes. But if I, if I don't believe that thing, you can't tell me what I am. And I'm constantly coaching my boys on this, right? They come home, Jimmy called me this on the playground. And I'm like, are you that? And he's like, no. And I'm like, doesn't matter what Jimmy called you, right? Like people can only make us feel inferior if we already feel that thing. And, and here's the cool thing about it, Chad. If you don't want to be, do something about it. Work That's harder. Nobody cares, right? Work harder. So yeah. I, I'm a, I had a, a term that people used to call me uh, that would make me really angry. And it was because my father used that term. So I believed it. 
right? So when he would call me- And that gets me, back to thinking, like, think before you think, right? They, they you say, go, right? you're like, I'm pissed. And you're like, wait a minute, why am I so pissed about that? Oh, because my right. dad- you- And I've been able to think about what I think and now say, well, wait a minute. He didn't really know who I was anyway to use that term when he would refer to me. And he ha- doesn't have that space or power in my life anymore. So that word doesn't have that space or power. I'm not going to make that connection any longer. So now if somebody used that term on me, uh, I'm laughing it off. Like you said, right? I- I'm not. So have a nice day, right? And you're able to move on from whatever that comment word terms are. It's a great point, Bob, that you know you are only... Uh, no one can make you feel badly. No one can make you feel inferior unless you give them the the right to do it. I, I think this next hack is one that many have probably heard. I don't think this one's uh, original. It's that you are and you become what you see, listen to, and read, right? So we've heard this in other ways. It says five years from now, the only thing that'll be different about you is who you are influenced by and what you are choosing to read, Right. Uh, that's the only changes that'll happen. The challenge with this one, Bob, is confirmation bias, right? A lot of times you'll read something looking for it to just prove what you already believe. Uh, and you've got to be careful with that, that you're not just bringing I mean, look, it, information for the here's fact. Here's the thing. If, if you set out, like, let's say you're like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read something. <laughs> you're yep. like, I'm, I'm going to stimulate my brain right now. If you do it unintentionally, like you go on Facebook or you go on LinkedIn, or you, it's going to feed you the thing that you already think and believe. Yes. Right? So you, like in this arena, I think you really have to set out to, to find things that you want to consume versus just going and opening your phone up and consuming whatever pops up at you. Well, and right. I think we have to also be careful by, and I'm going to use something very topical, of course. Again, I don't know when this absolutely drops. Uh, it might have dropped after the election even. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure on the date. Yet, if you're a Republican and you're reading from certain sites that are Republican-heavy sites, or if you're a Democrat and you're, you're just, it's just confirmation bias, yeah. right? You're just going out there and reading from the authors that are telling you exactly what you want to hear so that you feel better about your choice, right? Make sure you're choosing things to read that actually open up your mind open up opportunities, right? Don't say, uh, I read a book called The 5 a.m. Club by Robin Sharma. Uh, And don't be the person who says, I'm never waking up at 5 a.m. So why do I want to read a book about The 5 a.m. Club? I'm going to read the book about I can sleep in late, right? But then again, there's going to be people who are morning people who are going to say, well, I'm going to read that book for the confirmation that yes, waking up at 5 a.m. is absolutely the right thing that I should be doing. That's not what the book tells you. But that's what it's all about, right? In my, I'm confirmation bias. Be careful. The people you have conversations with, the things you see and what you read, because that's going to be one of those great life hacks for you. If you can read and implement, not always read only what you believe going in. Bob, this next, next one is a little, this next one's a little bit like, I, I like it. Anyway, remember everyone you, you need put is the list together. I know. I, I like it, but but it's a little like when you hear it, you're just like, oh, how does this practically apply to me? Right. So everyone that you meet is afraid of something, loves something, and has lost something. And right. so, like, as I think about this, um, what it makes me think is look, we often look at other people and think, ah, they don't have the same problems I have. Right. Like they, Ben Kinney got to that point because he was something different or that person's, you know, now the, the governor of the state. Cause there's some, when you, when you're out in the world and you meet people, sometimes like I, I used to really in our twenties and thirties, we got a chance to, to rub elbows with a lot of like very smart, successful Chad, right. They were, they were selling lots of houses and running big companies and doing all these things. And, until I could like look at them as humans in some way, it was hard for me to feel like I fit in. Once yeah. I realized though, and I didn't take this approach necessarily, hey, everybody that you meet loves has loved something, has lost something, has is fearful of something. But I definitely took an approach of like, these are just normal people. And so th- these are three things that every normal person would have done, right? Loved, lost, and and, um, and, and, and is afraid of something and fearful of something, right? It just, it humanizes people. 
Yeah, and, and Bob, I, I've got to say, and I've been working on it, of course. Empathy was never my my top trait. That's never going to make my list top trait. I'm I'm a big believer in nobody cares work harder, right? Not oh, it's okay. But if I can remember this, I at least have more compassion for people because I know that I'm afraid of certain things. I know that I love certain things and certain people that if they were taken away from me, what that could do to me. I know that I've definitely lost things along the way. Um, and if I can just remember that whether I know what yours are or not, I know you absolutely are scared of something, Bob, you absolutely love somebody and you absolutely have lost something along the way. I'll at least have more compassion, even if I might not have more empathy for the situation. And I think that is something that is really missing in the world. Folks, one of the things that has helped make someone like Ben a success since we talk about is his compassion to people, right? People want to be around him because of his compassion. They want to be in that universe. They want to replicate stuff like that. And that attracts people to him, which can attract people to all of us. Remember it, it'll make the world a better place. Bob, this one on your list, I, I, I actually went, I looked at your list and I said, okay, I am going to make sure I get to do nobody cares work harder. And I'm going to make sure I get to do this one, okay. which is the less stuff you have, the less you'll worry about. Hmm. And, and that can be at every level. And the reason I wanted to make sure I talked about this one, Bob, is we just did it with this move. Right, we went from three thousand square feet down to thirteen hundred square feet. We had to downsize a lot of stuff. Nita and I had to purge a lot of stuff. We had to get rid of a lot of things. We had to realize a lot of changes were happening because of the choices we wanted to make by downsizing into this location. I haven't been this happy, and I couldn't tell you how long. Because there is a weight that gets lifted from us. We get in our lives, we are younger, we have nothing because we are younger and we don't have it yet. We start to create income, whatever our career path is, we start, and we start to spend that income. And then we get to the stressor, Bob, of I have to make more money just to keep up with where I am, mm. right? The less expensive stuff specifically, but just the less stuff in general, the happier you will be. If you want a life hack and you're young enough to be listening to this because your parents have got you listening to the Win Make Give podcast with us, don't start becoming that person that just spends because you need the retail therapy. Understand, minimal things that are special to you will matter way more with less stress than lots of things because you're keeping up with the Joneses. Chad, I, I, I totally agree, by the way. I, but I see, a, like I think about the, for me personally, in a very particular, like not my whole life, but in a very particular place, I've tried to apply this. And I know it's, it's made me I less stressed. But I, I, so, you know, you've never seen me I, for the last four years, I think since, since COVID, I don't think you've ever seen me in anything other than the shirt I have on right now. Yeah, it's, I don't a, think so. it's a Lululemon hoodie. It's this black hoodie. I wear it everywhere. If you've ever seen me in public in the last four years, I'm in that shirt. I generally have the same hat on too. But I started doing this in, in like my outside of work life. Like I, I found a t-shirt I love, Chad. I got rid of all my other t-shirts. I only have like five pairs of that one t-shirt. I'm done. Yep. Like if I'm going to wear a t-shirt, it's that t-shirt. I <laughs> This is a, I do the laundry at our house. So I fold all, all the laundry in the socks and we have two young boys the laundry never ends literally never ends but what we did is we like the boys all have the same kind of sock i how many different kinds of socks do you have in your sock drawer and if you were to do two weeks worth of laundry you'd have you know five eight ten different socks at the end you gotta match those stupid things no i don't have to do that anymore why because my socks are all exactly the same every sock goes with every sock yeah i'm trying to create this like consistency and look gates did or um, um steve jobs did this and i'm not steve jobs right but the simplicity of every morning getting up and knowing exactly what i'm gonna wear and every time i go and do the laundry <laughs> the stuff all matches up really easy like i'm looking for these kind of hacks in my life to to reduce the amount of mental strain that i spend on those things because you don't realize it but all these little decisions we're making in our life are just a bunch of mental strain that at the end of the night make you tired yes absolutely and, and tired is an interesting word because tired meaning I want to go to sleep, but it's almost not tired. It's almost drained, 
right? In in that sense that it, it, it's your battery in life is drained. All right, Bob, let me recap your list before you hit the last one for us. Bob gave us a list of 11, 11 life hacks that are going to give you an unfair advantage. Uh, and we've thrown you off, right? They're not, oh, put this in your email and stuff. No, these are in your head, folks, right? So here we go. One, keep up with relationships outside of your immediate family. It's going to pay off in the long run for you. Number two was nobody cares, work harder. Number three, think about things that you think about, right? So think before you think, think about those thoughts, as we put it. Number four, competition is for losers. Five, obstacles is the way. Have those obstacles, learn it. Six, uh, love is best spelled T-I-M-E. Seven, nobody can make you feel badly or inferior if you don't let them. Number eight, you will become what you see, listen to, and read. Number nine, everyone you met, everyone is afraid of something, loves something, and has lost something. Uh, number 10, I just went over, which was the less stuff you have, the less there is to actually worry about, which will help you. Bob, your last one that you put on this list. You can be anything you want, just act like it. And here's, I, I'm tr I, I didn't live by this my whole life. I, I let a lot of negative thoughts come into my head, Chad. I, yeah. um, I've i been really working with my boys and I tell them all the time, hey, guess what? If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Like, you know, we've got the the book, The Secret. And, and like, I, I think we underestimate how much the power of what we decide we are, who we decide we are, defines what we become. It is absolutely true. I wish I would have learned it earlier in my career. I think, Chad, I waited until I was really, really confident and comfortable in saying, this is the person that I am. And um, man, I, I had the skills probably much sooner to realize it and, and then just decide that that is what I am. I'm like the number one expert in the United States at real estate CRMs. Like that's one of the things that I am. And it took me a while to really believe that. But I, I was never that if I didn't believe it. You will never yeah. be the things you want to be if you don't believe them. You can be anything you want. You just got to act like it. Now, here's the thing. It starts with the belief. Then you got to go take action. on it. Right? Yes. Well, yet the belief is the thing, right? I mean, if you uh, believe you're a good guitar player, you're more likely to pick up the guitar and play the guitar and sit around, therefore taking the action, therefore. If you believe you're not a good guitar player, you're going to avoid picking up that guitar all day long. I think it goes beyond that. I, I think like you don't have to believe you're a good guitar player because when we start, we're probably not. But I have to believe I'm capable of being a good guitar player, yes. right? Like I'm going to pick that thing up because I think I'm going to ultimately be a good one. I'm going to act as if I'm a good guitar player and I will grow into becoming that good guitar player. Uh, if you don't think that, if you don't act that, you're never going to act that way. And if you don't act that way, it's never going to happen. Put a guitar in my hand. You don't want to hear the sound that's going to come out of it, right? It's going to sound horrible. And that's for everything. Oh, if you think you're going to be a great public speaker, then go do it. You'll, you'll feel better. You'll be charge to go do it if you say oh I'm, I'm scared of doing that stuff okay then you're telling I, yourself i'm not a good public speaker i used to tell myself i'm bad at my calendar chad i'm bad at managing yes. my calendar and well, i just are. yet you finally told know, yourself I, decided, I started telling myself i'm capable of managing my calendar i'm yes, not telling myself i'm going to be amazing at it i'm only telling myself i'm capable of doing it right and so i'm leaning <laughs> towards doing it chad i don't think I've yes and it. i will tell you audience bob has canceled less times on me or reschedule advanced, less things. Advanced. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Or, or you've notified me weeks ahead and said, yes, I won't be there then because you're getting better at the calendar. Folks, Bob, Bob, you put together a great list for us. I challenge you to really take this one and say, Bob, this is on you. You tell us what we're going to talk about, not us. We'll find one. I, I wanted to see what you came up with. You have given us great, 11 great life hacks to give us an unfair advantage by getting into our head. Now, folks, I want you to come into our Facebook group, which is facebook.com slash winmakegive, because I still want to know what's that collection you have excess amount of, right? What's that thing? Bob's got his hats. We all know it. He's also got too many shoes. Now he's got too many baseball cards, right? I've got, I had before we purged too many books. What is it? You, I also had too many socks, 
Bob, to, to answer your thing, I had all the different fancy dress socks, right? I was helping make that trend a trend for a while. Now I have either workout socks or or everyday socks. They're slightly different, but easy to sort. Uh, folks, we want to know what's the crazy thing that you just have an excessive amount of. Join us in our Facebook group and tell us. Until our next episode, as always, do good.